sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour but now Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to have each of you with us this day as we once again gather to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As always, everything you need to know will be projected for you behind me here on our wall. We are celebrating Holy Communion at the end of the worship service, so if you didn't grab one of our communion kits on the way in, we invite you to do that now. Raise your hand, our usher will get that to you. We're also continuing our teaching series on um, enemies of the heart. And our children's message today will be um, for you guys and Jordan. So glad you're here, Jordan. Um, that's it. So I do pray that God bless each of you as you worship him this day. I invite you to stand up as we begin our worship service this morning. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands towards your most holy sanctuary. Friends, I invite you to join me now as we reflect upon our past week, bringing all those sins we know and those sins we don't know to God our Father. now together we cry out to our Lord, Father of mercy, we confess that we are not the people you created us to be. We confess that we are by nature sinners and in rebellion against your will. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by the things we have done wrong and the good we have failed to do. We have sinned against each other and broken the bonds of fellowship. Forgive us of our sins, remove the evil from our hearts and minds, and teach us to follow you with willing hearts. Now, friends, through the mercy of God in Christ Jesus our Savior, you have been made the children of God and received his mercy. Therefore, as the called and ordained servant of the word, I announce God's grace to you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated for our scripture readings? Our first reading today comes from Jonah, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see, that he, till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? This is the word of the Lord. God. Our second reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to invite our children up front now for our children's message. Good morning, Jordan. How are you? Good. Good morning, everybody. How are the big kids today? Good. Well, Jordan and, and all our big kids out there, you guys just heard our first reading, right, about Jonah. Now, Jonah was what? You guys remember? Jonah was angry. Anybody ever been angry? Jordan, have you ever been angry? Mom and Dad, Jonah, uh, uh, Jordan, ever been angry? Yes. How many of you have been angry? Right, we, we all get angry. Why do we get angry? Anybody have any idea? We get, we get angry because we are hurt. We get angry because we are hurt. Sometimes we're, we're angry because we're hurt because something's been taken away from us. Or we feel like we're owed something. And what often happens when we get angry is we hold on to that anger. But when we hold on to anger, does it make us feel any better? Jordan, what do you think? Do you feel, do you feel good when you feel angry or do you feel kind of sad eventually? It doesn't make us feel good, does it, to hold on to our, our anger? So then Paul, in his reading, he told us that we are to get rid of all anger. How do we do that? How do we get rid of all anger? Well, here's a little glimpse to what we do. We get rid of anger by forgiving if we're angry, we feel like somebody owes us something. And so if we want to get rid of our anger, we need to forgive them. We don't have to stay in that, that feeling of that we are owed something. Paul tells us to get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. And how are we able to forgive? Are we able to do that by ourselves? Nope. What had to happen to get forgiveness for us? Do you remember? Jesus died on the... That's right. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all our sins. And that's a wonderful gift that he's given to us. And now we have the Holy Spirit in us. Today's Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit is, is alive and he's well, and the Holy Spirit's inside of us, not only helping us know that we are forgiven of all our sins by Jesus, but now he helps us to forgive other people. So the way we can get rid of anger is by forgiving with the help of the Holy Spirit. I hope you remember that, and I hope you big kids remember that too. I invite you guys to pray with me this morning. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for forgiving me. For forgiving. Help me Get rid, Get rid of my anger, of my anger. And, help and help me to forgive others. To forgive others. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, Jordan. You can go back to your seat. I get to talk the whole time today. Lucky you guys. <laughs> well, once again, good morning. Thank you for being here and joining us today, both in the building and at home. If, if you've been with us in the building or worshiping with us at home over the last two weeks, 
you may or may not remember how we have started each of these messages. The way we've started each of these messages um, is that they're intended for us. You and me personally. Not thinking, not saying, oh, this person really needs to hear this today. Or, well, only if they were here to, to, to listen in to what Scripture says today. Nope, right? That's not what we're doing. Each of us, again, today is facing the difficult reality that we need to hear about the enemies of the heart. So we've said this the last couple of weeks, and as I was sharing with my kids at home about the topic for today, do you know what one of them said? Well, this will be a good one for... So for my children, and for you and me once again, let the words that you hear today speak to you. Let God and the powerful Holy Spirit work in your heart as we dig into this next powerful enemy of the heart. We pray. God, on this day we worship and praise you for who you truly are, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we give you thanks and celebrate this Pentecost, where we celebrate the faith that has been given to so many by the sending of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon this place, upon your church right now, and into the hearts of these, your people gathered here. That my words may be your words, and the words that you speak this day may resonate in our hearts and our minds as we continue to learn about your truth and love, even amidst the battle, the enemy of the heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So maybe greed wasn't for you. Maybe guilt didn't hit you. But what about anger? And again, I'm going to ask you now, you ever been angry? No, 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 no. Me neither, right? Yeah, no. We've all been angry. This is one that I've struggled with. This is one enemy of the heart that, that God and I have been wrestling with for years. You know who loves anger? Satan. Satan loves anger. And, and, and we all get angry from time to time. So what makes our anger burn? Now, before you go too far, I know you're thinking kids and spouse and boss and, and work and neighbors and those people that don't agree with you. But really, are, are they what make our anger burn? I don't think so. What, what really makes our anger burn is selfishness. It's selfishness talked a little bit about it with our, our, in our, our kids message as well. Selfishness is what really makes our anger burn. And, and it's a struggle. We're really generally quick to anger. We understand the first part of Proverbs 29, 11, where it says, fools vent anger. Right? How often do you feel foolish after a fit of rage? Don't worry, I've asked myself all these questions again this, this entire week. It, we feel foolish so often, right? We, we get angry with my kids over something silly. Or you have a fight about bread. You often feel about this tall when it's all done. Are we the first ones? No. We got, we got Jonah, right? I, I want to go back to Jonah for a, a, a little bit today. We got Jonah, and, and, and Jonah's pretty ticked off. He was really ticked off. First off, he didn't want to do what God sent him to do, and, and then he didn't want to do it because he knew God was going to do it. <laughs> but Jonah didn't like these people. 
So Jonah knew that God was going to relent when Nineveh repented. He knew it, so he became angry. Check this out. We're going to start in 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they had turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Why was Jonah so angry? It's because Nineveh was in Assyria. And Assyria was bad. Assyria was Israel's enemy. So Jonah wished that all his enemy would die. He wished they would all be dead. But Jonah knew God. He, he, knew, that, that he knew that his God, this true God, would do what he always does, so often does. He would relent, because that's who God, his God is. That's who our God is, a relenting, loving, slow-to-anger God. Even though the people of Nineveh had done all these bad things, no matter how bad they were, God was still slow to anger, and he relented. Now, it gets worse for, for Jonah here. He gets this selfish anger bug, is what I like to call it. Verses 3 and 4. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah would rather die than endure the reality of God's pity for Nineveh. He'd rather die himself than see God be merciful and loving to his enemies. Something's not right here. So, so God asked that rhetorical question, do you do well to be angry? No time for a response, right? God's really hoping that, that Jonah reconsiders this attitude. And so what do we see next? We still see God caring. For Jonah, look what happens next. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. So he was thinking, well, maybe. I got a front row seat still. Maybe. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when day came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. So he had a great seat, and then this nice plant that came up and, and protected him from the, the elements. Till the next day, this worm comes up and eats it, and it withers. And then when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? He said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? And also much cattle. What a great way to end the book. We're not going to get into the ending of the book today. But, but, but we got here God once again providing for Jonah. Even though Jonah is so angry, God provided him shade. Then the worm came and ate it, and the weather changed, and it changed as quickly as Jonah's attitude, right? He was so joyful. Great seat, ready to see whatever happens, and this nice, comfortable plant over him, and then it was gone, joyful to angry. God asked him that same question again, right? Do you do well to be angry? 
You had nothing to do with the plant. Did, did you plant it? Did you grow it? And that plant only had temporary value. The problem here with Jonah again is what? He wanted things his way. Back to the selfish anger. He wanted things his way, even if it was not part of God's plan. He wanted things his way, even if it interfered with God's love and grace to his enemies. He felt it was his right to be angry. So let's stop there now. Not me preaching, but let's just stop there. And, and look at this question a little bit that God asked Jonah multiple times. Do you do well to be angry? You see, that question just wasn't meant for, for Jonah, but it was meant for you and, and me today. Do you do well to be angry? What does culture say to this? Look around, and what do you see? You see a culture, you, you see a, a society that tells you you have the right to be whatever you want to be. Look around, and in culture, you will see that if you want to be angry, you be angry. You have the right to be angry. Your anger is justified. And it's even more than that, isn't it? They're saying, yes, you be angry, and the more outrage that you have, the more anger that you speak with, the more insults and, and hurting words that you throw, the more power you have, the more people will like you. Today's culture ever increasingly glorifies and praises anger. Our society says, you have the right to be angry. It says, you have a right for vengeance. They say, you do do well to be angry. What does Scripture say? Scripture simply says, Pastor Scott's words. Society today is wrong. Scripture doesn't actually say society today is wrong. I'm just helping you understand that. One of my professors at the seminary, Dr. Dr. Gibbs, said it best in an article he wrote a few years ago. There is a place for anger. There is a place for vengeance. But it does not belong to the disciples of Jesus. There's a place for anger. There's a place for vengeance, but it does not belong to the disciples of Jesus. For that prerogative belongs to God alone. Period. End of discussion. How about we still have anger? We, we, we still deal with it. So, so, so what does Scripture say? Well, there are two well-known passages in the New Testament that speak to anger. The first comes from our, our second reading today from Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read this for us again. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 25, it says this. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Okay, so first off, understand this. This is not a ringing endorsement for anger. That, that's not what it's saying here. Instead, what Paul is doing, he's warning us against anger because he knows it's so dangerous. Right? Right? He knows it's so dangerous. That's why verse 27 says, give no opportunity to the devil. Because
because it's so small where you move from that emotion of anger to, to living it out, to that, that sinfulness that comes from it. You see, unless we guard ourselves against uh, the, the attack of Satan, he will continue to use this emotion of anger to, to go at our hearts and to pull us away from Christ and his love and his forgiveness. Now, it's not just Paul. Hear what James says. Chapter 1, he says, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So, again, it doesn't say, don't get angry. Okay? That's an emotion. It's not saying don't get angry. It's just saying, just like he's not saying don't speak. He's being saying be slow to speak, being slow to anger. Okay? Because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. He wants us to understand that as followers of Jesus, when anger takes over our heart, when we, when we live this life in anger, we're, we're failing to conform to the way that God wants us to live, obviously. That's what sin is. So then what? What do we do today as, as disciples of Jesus living in today's culture? What are we supposed to do? Because as followers of Jesus, we look around and we do feel anger. We do feel this emotion of anger because there are so many injustices every single day that are happening in our, our own towns, our city, our nation, and our world. But that doesn't mean that we are free to let anger control our responses. Okay? We're, we're not free to let anger control our responses. Well, maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor Scott, anger mo motivates me. Anger motivates me to do something. Well, why should it take anger to motivate you to do something? Are, are you not called? as a follower of, of Jesus, to be different than the rest of the world? Do, do we not have a responsibility as followers of Jesus to reject the ways of culture and stand out and, and be different, to be salt, to be light, this beacon shining on a hill for all to see? Are, are we not disciples of Jesus who love because we are first loved? You see, it should not take anger to move us out to love our neighbor. It should not take anger to move us to stand up for truth or to speak out against injustice. It shouldn't. As followers of Jesus, we're to speak up in love and mercy and grace. How do we do that? Well, thank God today's Pentecost, right? We can bring the Holy Spirit in. Oh, wait, no, that's every week, right? But once again, it's, we, we look at the, the Holy Spirit. The assistance of the Holy Spirit is the one and the only one that moves us to go this way. Because I get it. Anger will not go away until Jesus comes back. It will continually be an enemy of the heart. So we have to ask ourselves, so what am I supposed to do with this anger? What am I supposed to do with this anger? Because I get mad, I get ticked, I get peeved off, whatever you want to say. We all get these things. Now, again, understand this. With, with human emotions, in, including anger, they are not intrinsically sinful. Okay? They're, they're not intrinsically sinful. However, it's also not a justification to remain in that emotion. It's not a justification to remain angry. All right, so, so that leads us to, all right, I am angry. Now what? I'm an angry, I'm angry, I'm upset, I, I'm looking around, and I'm just getting more and more angry. Now what do I do with this fight against the enemy of the heart? as a disciple of Jesus. First thing, 
Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit working inside you and me, inside our hearts, we acknowledge our anger. So these aren't new, by the way. These are, these are not some kind of novel ideas. We acknowledge our anger. That means we need to be aware of our emotions. When we, when we acknowledge our, our anger, we, we don't sit on it, right? And as that teapot boils up, it eventually toots its horn, it blows, right? So, so do we sometimes. So the first thing we do by the power of the Holy Spirit is we say, okay, I'm angry. I've acknowledged that. Now what do I do as a disciple of Jesus? confess it. That's right. Talk to someone about what you're dealing with. Talk about the anger that you're, you're feeling, about how the injustices you see happening around you are so appalling. Talk about your struggles. Find someone you trust who too knows Jesus. This is important. Because a follower of Jesus is so different than what culture says, right? So find someone else, a brother and sister in Christ that you can speak to. Maybe it's somebody you already know. Maybe you need to come talk to the crazy pastor, and, and he'll listen, and, and he'll listen, and he'll listen as you get it all out. Maybe you're involved in a missional community, and that's a trusted area for you to speak to people there. Now, this is hard. This is hard to do. Because why would we want to admit that we are struggling? Why do we want to make ourselves vulnerable? But here's the thing. With the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us and confessing this, this, this anger that we're struggling with, you honestly feel better once you get it out. Once you share it with somebody. Once you get it off the heart, it's harder for Satan to use it. Now, again, see, so that anger is going to come and come and come. You're going to have to do it again and again and again. Because if you keep it down there, if it keeps working on the heart, then, then Satan's going to use it. But the power of the Spirit can work in you to clear up that heart, to clear up your thinking, and then also determine ways for you to move forward in love. So you don't just sit like Jonah, <laughs> waiting for something to happen to those people. Now, another thing is, sometimes anger is deeply rooted. If this enemy of the heart is chronic, consider seeking help, like professional help. I mean this, and I say this because I love you, whether you're here or whether you're at home. There are trusted Christian professionals out there ready to help you, to help you see why anger is such a natural response from your heart, why it is so deeply connected to you. And there's no shame in this. No guilt. So, so please, if, if this is you, talk to me, and I will help you get in contact with someone. Or go ahead and talk to someone on your own. One more. So first, we have to acknowledge we have sin. Second, we confess it and we, we talk to people about it. And then the third thing that we need to remember as disciples of Jesus Christ about this teaching of anger, the most important one, is you are forgiven. Woo! Maybe you were already angry about bread this morning. I don't know. <laughs> this is the most important thing. There is freedom for you through
through Jesus Christ. God has given us a way to be saved from his righteous anger. You know it, like the back of your hand. From God, through Christ, to me, to you. From God, through Christ's blood shed on that tree. From God, through Christ's blood shed on that tree, body laid in an empty, t- blade in a tomb. From God, through Christ, to you and to me, by his body laid in a tomb, rose from the dead. Through this, you have been justified. You have been declared not guilty of your anger and of all your sin. For Christ died for you, forgiving you. Anger, it is a true enemy of the heart. And it so quickly becomes sin. But we know. We know as as disciples of Jesus Christ, we believe because of what Jesus has done. We believe because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit that we can leave vengeance to God. We can leave anger behind For we as believers in Jesus Christ are forgiven and freed. We're forgiven and freed to respond not with anger, but to respond with good. We're forgiven and freed to respond with love when others do evil. We are forgiven and freed to stand up and love and in grace, as we, yes, we as followers of Jesus, lead the way in loving our neighbors the way that we've been loved and forgiving in the way that Christ forgives because we have been forgiven too. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And now may the peace that pass all understanding keep our hearts, our minds focused on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand, friends, and join me as we make confession of the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to join me as we go to our Lord in prayer. As we do that, we continue to remember 
all those uh, named on our prayer list from previous weeks, as well as Joe Barbie's mother, who underwent um, emergency surgery down in St. Louis. And also, we um, remember Susan Pierce, who is hospitalized following a tragic um, car accident. Um, we thank God's hand for being around her um, and uh, ask for peace for the family um, of the other lady involved. We go to our Lord in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we thank you that you once again send your Holy Spirit upon us to create a faith in us that ever grows closer to you amidst the challenges that we face. Through it all, Lord, we are now knowing that no matter what happens, the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, rests upon us. We thank you that he gave his life to give us new life forever in heaven with you. Father, we ask that this day you take this truth to the ends of the earth, to use all your children, all your disciples of Christ, whether they're far across the ocean or in their own little neighborhoods, that you prepare the hearts that they will speak to by the work of your Holy Spirit, and that that same Spirit will speak through them, that they may share the hope and the love that you have amidst all the struggles of this world. Lord, we know that death and despair daily surround us. We know that this too will come to an end. But until that time, Lord, we pray for your guidance for those who are mourning. We especially lay before you those who have recently lost loved ones, that they may find peace and assurance in your grace and mercy that you have defeated death and won for their loved ones new life. Bring them that peace beyond all understanding during this most difficult time. Lord, many of our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ are struggling in body, mind, or soul. We humbly lay before you today Sam and Melissa and Brooklyn, Don and Joyce and Tim and Dan asking that you continue to provide your healing hand upon them. Father, we ask that you continue to be with Joe Barbie's mother. She's been hospitalized and undergone surgery. We pray for a quick recovery for her. Father, we pray this day for our dear friend, our sister in Christ, Susan. First, we give you thanks for putting your protection, your guardian angels around her amidst this horrific crash. We give you thanks and praise for the work you've already done and the work that you're continuing to do as you bring her full strength and full healing. Thank you for the doctors and nurses that are caring for her. Provide for Susan and Pat and all the family peace beyond all understanding and grace during this time of frustration. Allow them, Lord, to continue to know that you are in control of all things. And most certainly you have your children, Susan, and all of them in your hands. In the coming days, Lord, raise up the brothers and sisters in Christ to help the pierces out as Susan is nursed back to full health. Lord, Satan lies and he works his way into our hearts and the hearts of so many. We pray that you protect us from his evil attacks. We ask that you would give us the courage to stand up for truth, to be salt, to be light in this world that has become so dark. Give us honest and faithful words to speak and actions to do and love, guiding us and protecting us all the way. We ask that you watch over our world and this nation, that you continue to bless our leaders and our government, that good government and honest and faithful leaders may continue to lead. And Father, we pray that you end all violence 
that you end all war. We know this is only done through you, and so we turn it over to you. So we turn that over to you. We turn everything else over to you, Lord, knowing that you have all things in your hands. Prepare us now to receive this most wonderful gift of body and soul. And prepare us each and every day to know that no matter what is going on in our lives, you are always there. No matter when we don't even know what to say, that you have given us the ability to call out to you and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we do truly believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of the world. Through him and him alone comes our salvation and the promise of eternal life. In this Holy Communion, we believe that the body and blood of Christ are truly present in the bread and wine. And to those who receive him with a repentant and open heart, he gives the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Now our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Now in the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you. I invite you to go ahead now and pull out your communion kit. And as you're ready, peel back on the wafer side and then take and eat. For this is the true body of Jesus Christ given into death for all your sins. Jordan, may you continue to grow and know of God's great love for you, that he gave his life on a cross to forever give you life in heaven with him. Go forth this gift you and given in your amazing baptismal grace. And the same thing on the other side, friends, as you're ready. Take and drink, for this is the true blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's hill for the forgiveness of all your sins. And now that you've received this true body and this true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may his strength preserve you steadfast in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in our Lord's love, his joy, and his never any peace, knowing all your sins have been forgiven. Amen. Now, friends, receive this blessing from our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. I invite you to join our praise team today in singing Same Power. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear sound of nations rising up we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome i can walk down this dark and painful road i can face every fear of the unknown i can hear all god's children singing out we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome from the grave the same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us lives in us the same power that moves mountains when he speaks the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us lives in us he lives in us lives in us. We have hope 
that his promises are true in his strength. There is nothing we can do, yes, we know. There are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. Thanks for being here, friends. Just a few short announcements for you. Go ahead and have a seat, and then we'll get you on your way. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. My name is Chad Sherman. I'm a director of Christian education here, and today is the last Sunday of Sunday school, which means we completed a modified year of Sunday school uh, throughout a worldwide pandemic. This would only be possible with our amazing Sunday School teachers. So could we please give them a praise offering for everything that they've done? Those people include Sally Martin. And it just occurred to me this morning, you do not have to be in the front of church to be a Sunday School uh, teacher. So Lauren Jensen. <laughs> Melody Borsma, yeah, and then Susan Langloy and Haley Dunn. Again, uh, as a result of, of these women, our children and we thereby have been so blessed. So thank you to them, and uh, we look forward to uh, just many more great years of Sunday school here at Luther Memorial. So thank you. Thanks, Chad. Also, we do have a special um, adult Bible study today. Uh, Jackie Roth will be sharing her testimony, um, her story of faith. If you don't know about Jackie, she came over from Germany, and she knew absolutely nothing about Jesus. She actually was an atheist. Uh, it's a very interesting story, so I invite you to stick around and, and hear that as well. And then our third one is Marie from Options for Women is here uh, as we're going to partner with them again. What'd you do? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're fine as long as you're... Okay. Good. Is this thing on? Is this working? Okay, wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Thank you so much for letting me come and visit you today. Yes, I got a stress fracture in my foot, but we're in the healing process, so this is good. Prayers would be appreciated. So my name is Marie, and as Pastor said, I'm from Options for Women. We are the pro-life pregnancy resource clinic here in town, and I am the director. So I just wanted to come today to just give you some updates on our ministry, and also just thank you for your church's partnership. It has been a good couple of years now where Lutheran Memorial has just been such a strong partner with our ministry. So you're supporting our ministry as we reach out in service to the River Falls community. So I really just wanted to come and thank you in person today for that partnership and give you some updates in terms of what our ministry has been up to. 
So please allow me to introduce options for women. As I said, we're a pro-life pregnancy resource clinic. We're located right on Main Street, and our mission is to offer support and services to women and families experiencing an unexpected or difficult pregnancy or parenting situation with the hope that through our support they can choose life for their children. So we're a nonprofit, we're a Christian ministry, and we're a medical clinic. And all of our services are free and confidential. So some of the services are listed up there on the slide. So we have a medical side of what we do, pregnancy testing, ultrasound, STD testing. We have a nurse on site to see, to see clients. We can sign them up for badger care. We can get them set up with prenatal care. So we have a whole medical side of what we do. And then we also have a social services material assistance side of what we do. So we help with free baby supplies and financial assistance and other just practical needs. So we have one mom who's set to deliver this Thursday. And through some of our partners, we were able to get multiple meals that will be made homemade and then just delivered ready made for her. So just practical needs for these women and families as well. And then we have kind of an education and mentoring program. So we have pregnancy and parenting education, a whole curriculum that covers that. And it's a very personalized program so that parents can really have the confidence and the excitement that they need to be able to welcome this new life into the world. And then we also just recently started a new program, which we're so excited about, called Someone Beautiful. And this is an individual one-on-one -on -one program for the women, and it really touches on all the elements of who they are as women so that they can be healthy, happy, and whole. So it's really an effort in investing in them as women to help them avoid a crisis situation in the first place. And so that's just a beautiful, fruitful new program that we just recently started within the past couple of months. So that's a little bit about 